Good evening, I'm Harold Holzer, director of the Roosevelt House Public Policy Institute. And on behalf of Hunter College President Jennifer Rabb, I wanna thank you for attending this virtual event to mark Black History Month. At a historic moment in the history of our judicial system, for many reasons, including yesterday's Ahmaud Arbery verdict uh, on one hand, and the pushback against President Biden's pledge to diversify the US Supreme Court on the other, we're reminded always of the hard work needed to maintain a democracy that fully reflects the full diversity of American life. Justice Stephen Breyer's impending retirement, giving President Biden his first chance to fill a Supreme Court vacancy has sparked an extraordinary amount of discussion even before the choice is made, and renewed discussion as well on the subject of diversity on the high bench. Legal scholars and practitioners alike have raised concerns about a possible crisis of confidence uh, and legitimacy in the courts, noting that in order to function, the judicial branch as much as any other requires public trust in not only individual decisions, but in the institution as a whole. Today, we're reminded more than 80% of sitting federal judges are white and 73% are male. Um, and to quote Justice Elena Kagan, who I might remind our viewers was a graduate of Hunter College High School, people look at an institution and they see people who are like them who share their experiences, who they imagine share their set of values. And that's a sort of natural thing. And then they feel more comfortable with what occurs. In this spirit, we are, well, we are pleased to welcome an esteemed panel of accomplished jurists this evening. The Honorable Erica Edwards, the Honorable Janine Johnson, the Honorable Tanya Kennedy, and our final guest, the Honorable Malika Scott McLaughlin. Uh, they will be given the fulsome uh, introductions they deserve from our host tonight. I just want to uh, uh, introduce him and hand over the introductory responsibilities to the director of our public policy program at Roosevelt House, Basil Smeichel. Um, Dr. Smeichel is distinguished lecturer and director of the program. Um, he served earlier at the appointment of former Governor David Patterson as executive director of the New York State Democratic Party during the 2016 presidential cycle, uh, during which he was officially the second highest ranking Democratic Party official in the state. Basil holds a PhD in politics and education and an MPA from Columbia University and received his Bachelor of Science from Cornell. Um, it's been a, a great pleasure uh, and an inspiration, really, to work with Basil for these last six months. And as Hunter becomes more and more fully in person, his presence and uh, uh, his impact will be felt even more keenly. So, Basil, thank you for assembling this terrific panel. I look forward to your discussing everything from the criminal courts in New York to the Supreme Court in Washington. With that, it's a pleasure to hand over the proceedings to Dr. Basil Smeichel. Thank you so very much, uh, Harold, for, um, for that very kind introduction and the pleasure uh, is, has been all mine. And thank you so very much for your support. Many thanks also to President Rabb, the president of Hunter College for the support and guidance in, uh, in that, that she provides to Roosevelt House. And I also wanna say uh, thank you uh, to the entire Roosevelt House team um, Aaron, Mac, Danny, Phil, Bianca, Alexis, and Peter, thank you all um, for your help and support in putting this uh, program together. There is a lot that Roosevelt House does. We have a lot of public programs. We have a lot of fellowship programs for students. Um, and you can check out Roosevelt House by going to roosevelthouse.hunter.cuny.edu. Um, tonight's program will contain a question and answer period. Uh, I must say that the for the audience that is interested in asking questions, you can certainly um, do so throughout. 
of the conversation, but I will likely get to them um, in the last um, 15 or so minutes of our dialogue tonight, um, rather than ask direct questions of the panel, uh, or ask them directly, I should say, we encourage you to put them in the Q&A and I will, I, will, I will refer to them from that, uh, from that space. So uh, I am thrilled, and I mean absolutely thrilled tonight to engage this important topic at such a crucial time in history by being able to speak to and with four outstanding women who are making history in their own right in our own backyard. First, I'd like to uh, welcome and introduce Honor, uh, the Honorable Erica Edwards. Uh, Honor, uh, Judge Edwards was elected to the New York City Civil Court for Manhattan in 2011 and 2016. She was elected to the Supreme Court and she is currently serving in New York County civil term where she presides over a variety of civil matters and specializes in medical malpractice cases. She previously served as a judge in the New York County criminal term and New York City criminal courts. She graduated from Penn State University, that's the Nittany, Nittany Lions, if I know my sports correctly, right? And the Howard University School of Law. Thank you, Judge Edwards, for Thank joining you. us today. The Honorable Janine R. Johnson assumed the bench in 2019 upon election to the civil court of the city of New York. Um, Judge Johnson was first assigned to the Bronx Criminal Court where she presided over misdemeanor matters in an all purpose part. Prior to, prior to being elected in 2018, she served as principal court attorney to the Honorable Jeffrey Wright and for over 12 years as general counsel and chief of staff to two senior members of the New York State Legislature. Judge Johnson is a graduate of SUNY Buffalo and also Howard University School of Law. Thank you, Judge Johnson, for uh, being with us tonight. The Honorable Tanya R. Kennedy. Judge Kennedy is an Associate Justice of the state's Appellate Division, First Department. Prior to her appointment in July of 2020, she served as a Justice of the Supreme Court, New York County, and the Supervising Judge of the County's Civil Court. She serves on the board of directors of the New York City Bar Association, the board of overseers of the Benjamin N. Cardoza School of Law, where she received her law degree, and the advisory board of Penn State Law. Justice Kennedy is a former adjunct professor at Fordham University School of Law, where she taught uh, a juvenile justice seminar for 10 years and is a past president of the National Association of Women Judges. She served her undergraduate degree, I'm sorry, received her undergraduate degree from Penn State, another Nittany Lioness, okay. And finally, Judge Malika Scott McLaughlin, the Honorable Malika Scott McLaughlin, is a housing court judge. She was appointed by Chief Administrative Judge Lawrence K. Marks in 2019 and presently sits in Bronx County Housing Court. She re received her Juris Doctor from Pace University School of Law and her Bachelor of Arts from Sarah Lawrence College She's a member of the Bar of the State of New York and the United States District Court for the Southern District of New York. Prior to becoming a housing court judge, she was an associate attorney for the Honorable Ann Katz, the supervising judge of the of New York City, of the New York County uh, Housing Court. Uh, your honors, it is a pleasure to have you with us this evening. Thank you so very much for uh, your time. We know that it's precious, so we will do our best to keep this within our time frame. Um, for those joining us this evening in, in our audience, just a reminder that you can ask questions by putting those questions in the Q and A um, in the Q and A section in chat. So let's just get right into it. Um, as was noted a bit in the introductions, some of you are elected and some of you are appointed. Um, we, we're hearing a lot about what's happening in DC with the sort of nomination process of this next Supreme Court justice, but you don't just become a justice uh, 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 just like that. Um, there's actually a path that you follow being elected or appointed. So if you could tell us, each of you, tell us a little bit about how you actually got to be a judge. If I could start with uh, Judge Scott McLaughlin, I, I would love to hear your thoughts. Sure, I was um, a court attorney first for a long, long time, and then went through different panels to be appointed to the housing court. And panels be are 
they are the group of people, they're lawyers, and they're also some um, non-lawyers who evaluate whether or not you are qualified to do the job. It's largely your peers. Yep. yep. Subcommittee, big committee. Once they say you're okay to go through, you go to the next level, the city bar, they check you out, evaluate you, and then Judge Marks meets with you and decides whether or not you should have the job. Oh, outstanding. Judge Johnson, similar path? Well, I was elected. Uh, Judge Scott McLaughlin was appointed. I was elected, and so I uh, ran in a primary uh, and successfully in the primary and the general election, getting the Democratic Party's nomination for a small, a small district, a local seat is what it's called from the municipal court district back in the day when New York City was unincorporated. They had the municipal court. And so those still exist. And the district I ran in is a Harlem seat. Um, and so very proud to have that seat. There are screening panels. Um, there were many things that I had done throughout my career that um, gave me the benefit of not having to go through the screening process. Just the local community was very excited and supportive um, about me having the local seat. And so I was able to get the Democratic Party support and be elected in 2019. After being a, a lawyer for, you know, the statutory time. I, Is it, was that 10 years? In more, I was, yes, the statutory time was 10 years. Okay. Thanks, Judge Kenny. How about you? Who's your path? I also uh, am elected. I ran countywide. That was the entire uh, borough of Manhattan in, in civil court and went through similar panels as well and then Supreme Court, the first district. But just one quick nugget, because I worked at Corporation Council and then I clerked for a judge. But with respect to Corporation Council, um, I had a Black woman supervisor, Betty Lawrence Lewis, and I know that she's very familiar with uh, Malika's father. And I remember her telling me that I was going to be a judge. I laughed at her because I did not see myself in that role. But very often, people see things in you that you don't see in yourself. So that's why programs like this, it's so important because we have to speak into the lives of others and, and give them an example. Yeah. And I, there's a point about that I wanna come back to, but I would love to hear from uh, Judge Edwards uh, with respect to your, your path. Sure, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, it's indeed. Okay, great. So I was a regular lawyer for about, uh, you had asked me the other day. So I figured out it's about 18 years. Um, I was an assistant district attorney, and then I worked at a law firm. And then I was, most of my career was a criminal defense attorney and uh, mostly in federal court in the Southern District, um, doing some court appointed work and in state court as well. Um, personal injury, wills, things like that. And then uh, I tried actually both ways. I tried to be appointed by the mayor and at the same time ran uh, to be elected. Um, Judge Kennedy was one of my mentors. So, you know, it's good enough for her. It's good enough for me. <laughs> and, um, you know, just my work in the community and everything. And I ended up uh, getting a countywide seat, which was, uh, which was a little bit different um, than what Judge Johnson just spoke about. And uh, then I became elected to uh, Supreme Court a few years later. Now, going back to Judge Kennedy's point, I mean, how much of how important is it as we listen to uh, President Biden say that he was committed to fulfilling his promise to appoint an African American woman to the Supreme Court? Judge Kennedy talked about that sort of somebody approaching you and saying, "This is this is who you are," sort of breathing that into you. Um, how important is it that Biden reaffirmed his promise? How important is it that? you see someone that looks like you on the Supreme Court. What were your first thoughts? And uh, I'll start with you, Judge Edwards. What were your first thoughts? What went through your mind? And how important is it to you for this position to be held by an African-American woman? So let me be honest. I cheered and did a dance. <laughs> okay? I hollered, did a dance. My friends were texting, making fun of me. You know, oh, are you going to be nominated? Do you? No, 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 not me. You know, you know things like that. Um, because I have to remember, for many of my friends, I'm the only judge they've ever met. You know, mm -hmm. um, so I mean, the point for me, 
was it's it's actually bittersweet in a way that it it would still be the first um, coming up. I wanted to be the first black woman to land on Mars. You know, I still do. <laughs> so I have a shot at that. I don't have a shot at this anymore. Um, but I mean, my feeling is I want the best candidate. And if the best candidate happens to be an African American woman, which it appears it might be um, in this situation, then I'm all for it. But I'm not about you know I want. I want to check this box or check that box. Next person has to be LGBTQ or the next person has to be this. We want the best person. I know we're going to get into diversity and how important that is. Um, so I'll leave it at that. But I'm, I'm thrilled, but I want the best person. Judge Scott McGonkin, what, what, what were your thoughts? It is always extraordinary to people that look like you in extremely high places where ordinarily we weren't being in those rooms. So to have to see the opportunity for someone to look like myself and my daughters sitting on the highest court of the land, which has transformed our society over and over and over again, is an extraordinary opportunity. I, that like um, as Edward said, if she's as qualified or if he is qualified, the person who looks like us, fantastic, best candidate, of course, for the job. All right, Judge Johnson. I agree with my colleagues that it, it's, a phenomenal, um, it's a phenomenal thing to see someone like yourself in those kinds of positions. I got goosebumps when I read it. I was so happy, so excited. I think um, beyond uh, anyone who's qualified having the position, it is important that Biden hold to his commitment because um, that was something that many people um, were excited about and supporting his presidency. And so people should do what they promise to do. Mm -hmm. um, that was one of the things. So I'm, I'm, I'm super excited about it. And, and Judge Kennedy, I, I want to ask you the same question with a, with a, with a bit of a tag uh, on, at the end of it, because you're, in a, a, you're on the appellate court. So diversity means something very specific to you, because you know, for, those, for, those, for, the, for the lay folks in the audience, the civilians here, uh, that means, if I understand it correctly, that you have to go into a room with other judges and, and is, is argue your position, um, try to get them to see your way, and they may be trying to get you to see their way. So, so diversity not, is not just about you being a face on the bench. It's actually, you know, I, I, God, I don't want to use a Hamilton quote, but uh, to be in the room when it happens, right? Um, so what, what's that like? You know, let me say that I was also extremely excited and, and moved to, to just think about the fact that a Black woman would join the, the, the nation's highest court. And, and for me, it, it's, it's because having a diverse uh, bench, it really um, promotes a person's confidence and respect for the rule of law, as well as um, respect for the law. When you have jurists, that's really reflective of the community. So now let me get to your question. The bottom line is that I now am part of a court and it's a 21 member court. And I'm happy to say it's very diverse mm -hmm. with respect to uh, women. There are more women on my court than men. Also persons of color, the person uh, who is the presiding justice is uh, uh, a gentleman who hails from the Dominican Republic. But we decide cases presently in a panel of five. And if someone has to recuse themselves, then it's a panel of four. And, and certainly the research bears it out. Uh, don't take my word for it, but you can Google and do, do your own due diligence that having a diverse uh, bench really leads to better decision-making. So when we're talking about the panel, let's think about this. You know, certainly we all have biases. We all have biases, but when you have these different people together, it kind of puts that bias in check, right? It, it decreases it. And, and also, uh, we hold uh, each other accountable with respect to our votes, but also 
um, you know, different perspectives. So if we're talking about women, if we're talking about persons of color, if we're talking about people with different uh, sexual or excuse me, uh, sexual orientations or sexual identities, all of those things, it brings a, a different perspective and perhaps can uh, educate uh, colleagues on, on a particular issue that they may not have considered. So really, when you have all of these people together, uh, you, you're better able to have more of a critical eye and a critical ear with respect to the issues uh, that come before you. I just wanna say one more thing that the time is limited, but also, you know, it, you know, it's about ge geography and diversity, certainly subject matter. You know, there are certain people on my court who have a, a wealth of knowledge as relates to criminal law, uh, you know, commercial law and the like. So when you take that along with your life experiences and, 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 and how you view things, uh, it's a win-win situation. Now, and, and, and that diversity is important and those life experiences are, are incredibly important because I'm, I wanna go to you, uh, Judge Scott McLaughlin, because you sit um, in housing court. Yeah. Um, the moratorium on evictions has been lifted. As of January 15th, it is, it is over. That, so that pause has concluded, yes. So your, I imagine your desk is quite the scene right now. Um, got a lot of emotions. Got a lot of emotions. emotions. <laughs> to, to, to get more so, than judgments, no question. Yes. And so, what? So, so tell us from your vantage point. You know, what happens when someone walks into the court and sees you on the bench, and and, and talk a bit about, you know, how how we how you can use your your platform to uh, to I guess promote diversity and fairness or, or diversity in thought? So I sit in the Bronx where our population is mostly black and brown tenants coming in for a variety of housing court issues. And some of them have experience with the judiciary in various capacities, whether it be family court, criminal court, every other venue. So they're familiar with issue in some way. And sometimes they walk in thinking, I may not believe them because others treat them in a certain kind of when they come into a courthouse, into a courtroom. And so one of my jobs, I feel, is to make sure they feel that I see them as they are, that I will give them time to be heard, and also strongly suggest they take the free counsel they can now obtain based on the new right to access to counsel and housing court. And that's, like, that's been a game changer, hasn't it? Huge. Transformed our practice, transformed how we do business, particularly during COVID where people have technology challenges. They don't have working cell phones all the time. They don't even have laptops. They have all kinds of a, of a homemade quilt of technology. So having a free lawyer who can do the extra work can find them. Where are they? Are they in the hospital? Did they have COVID? Did they pass away? What, what is happening? And I can't find that information, but a free lawyer can. And then tell me what happened and then how we can proceed forward. So it's been huge, huge. And one thing that I would I would I would ask as a as a you know sort of piggyback on that Judge Johnson um, is that you know we've being on the bench um, there are expectations of you being on the bench and somebody walks in walks in the court and sees you and I think at the heart of what we're talking about in terms of diversity is this presumption that there's a fair amount of discretion that you as judges have. Um, and we see a lot of that in, even in the newspapers today with respect to things like bail reform and so on. But can you talk a little bit about the, whether or not it's right for us to assume that as judges, that you actually do have as much discretion on, in matters as we think you do um, and how, you know, how we should maybe think differently about your day-to-day -day job? Well, whether it's right, you know, public, opinion is one of the most um, what, one of the most difficult things to corral in any direction. Uh, judges do though have discretion in, in, in some areas. Um, 
but in the area of bail reform, it is very, very sticky. I think that uh, largely the concept of what the Constitution requires with regard to bail not being used in a punitive manner is not spoken about as much as it should be. And, and that's because um, when it comes to matters, uh, the criminal nature, things are very, they're very personal. It's very emotional. It's very charged. You have someone who asserts themselves as a victim. You have someone who asserts themselves as uh, an innocent defendant. And so these are issues of real issues of life and liberty. Um, and I think judges who are diverse come to the bench with a certain level of exposure to some of the issues that may shape how they exercise the discretion that they do have. Um, and I would say also that it's important that there be diversity in thought and diversity in philosophy. And that is not all, that's not solely restricted to a person's color. Um, there have been many of my colleagues who could um, join me at my family reunion because we are similarly aligned in philosophy and some of these issues. Um, I think that is the most important part of diversity, alluding back to what Judge Edwards spoke about, about the most qualified candidate. Yes, you do want there to be diversity in terms of ethnicity and color, which has a different um, psychological effect, more of what Justice Kennedy spoke about, but that doesn't only come. The actual impact, the actual positive impact doesn't only come, and it doesn't always come when there's a person of color on the bench, I would say as well. And I wanna bring you into this as well, Judge Edwards, because um, you sat, you were, you, you ran an organization, was it Judicial Friends? Yes. And so, 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 and so, so these were colleagues of yours of color um, across the state. So talk a little bit about, you know, how you all thought about both discretion, but also change and advocacy within your institutions, because that, you know, even if there are things that, you know, even if we're trying to understand sort of the role of judges in, in the work that they can and cannot do on the bench, is there a way that you can impact the institution from within? Um, and if you could talk a little bit perhaps about that and maybe how the, the colleagues in Judicial Friends thought about thought about advocacy within institutions, within an institutional framework. Absolutely. So all of us actually on this call are members and uh, Judge Johnson is uh, one of our vice presidents, Judge Kennedy, I believe a board, board of directors. Um, nope, not anymore, not anymore. Okay, never mind. Oh, that's right. She was busy running all the women judges nationally and everything like that. But um, sure, you know, one thing it's to me, the most difficult thing about being a judge, and I knew it, I knew it going in was that we cannot take a stand on like social justice and political issues, cases that could become a case or controversy, not just an actual case already. So uh, people don't realize that. They may think we're we're not that we don't care or that we're not being vocal enough. You know, same thing like athletes. You know, but it, for us, it's it's an ethical violation if we were to take a stand. You know, Black Lives Matters, things like that. We would have to recuse ourselves from cases. We would it would have the appearance of not of us not being fair, um, you know, a whole bunch of things. But one thing we can do, the one thing we can do is try to affect change within the court system and what we need to do to help the administration of justice. So I know the organization um, that you referred to, the Ju Ju Judicial Friends Association, we were able to try to lend our hand at that. We had probably, you know, 70 something judges who were willing to serve um, on a committee and to contribute to find ways of that we can make the New York State court system better. We did prepare a report at the chief judge's request. She um, asked us, not just us, but everybody who had um, an opinion about it to submit something and we did. I think our report was, um, it was pretty long. I know it was over 70 something pages plus exhibits. They may not have asked for all of the graphs and exhibits, but it's, it's so important to us, not just to be, as you said, in the room, but to be in a position where we can succeed and have the same opportunities that everybody else does. And a lot of people may not realize, but as judges of color, you know, we too struggle, 
you know, um, to try to make sure that we have the same opportunities as people that don't look like us. Um, I was always taught you have to be 10 times better, you know, um, coming up. And I do still feel that way. I try to tell younger judges the same thing. We can't do what everybody else does um, because we're just not in that position. You know, it will come down hard on us. Um, so, you know, that's what we do try to do. We're able, whatever we're able to do, we, we do our best. We write letters. If there's some sort of injustice that we have to speak on, we support each other. Um, and this is throughout the, the whole state. And it's actually state and federal judges of color. Okay. Now, there are a number of questions in the, in the Q&A. And I just wanted to um, say again, for those that are um, listening to this great discussion that you can put your questions for the panel in the, in the Q&A, and I will get to as many as possible. Um, there was one thing that I was going to wait for towards the end, but I actually think these two questions uh, are probably really good to speak on now. Um, and I'm gonna start with uh, you, Judge, uh, uh, Judge Johnson. It would be nice for each speaker to identify one judicial uh, ju justice or lawyer who inspired them in their career and how. It could be a family member or not. <laughs> judge Johnson, I'll start with you. A judge that inspired us? A judge right? or lawyer who inspired okay, well, them and their career. I Right here, Judge Edwards. She, Justice Edwards, was had a huge impact on my career. I did not know an attorney until I got to college. And I, I met her in law school, um, but I just did not have exposure to attorneys. But it was something that I always knew that I wanted to do. And I went to Howard Law, and I chose Howard because of the strength of its alumni network. And she completely filled those shoes. And I'm grateful to her for the opportunity that she gave me. I was an intern in her practice um, when I was in law school. Oh, wow. And I would not let her or her two partners get rid of me. I, I, <laughs> I, I clung to them like a piece of lint. I wanted to be everywhere they were. I wanted to see everything they did. And she is very humble about um, her position with regard to the federal um, defender. She was one on the federal 18B panel. She I may have been the only or one of a handful of women who were on that panel. Um, two, two black women. <laughs> two black women on, on the entire federal 18B panel, right? Mm. It just, when I, I was blessed and fortunate enough to seek people I, had, I did find them. I would make that a footnote to everyone who's listening, who wants to have a legal career, who wants maybe to go to the bench. I sought them out and I pursued my relationship with them. I'm grateful that they extended their hand in return, but you can't wait for the door. You can't wait for someone to present the door to you. You have to yeah. find 10 doors, try to kick them all open at the same time and walk through as many as possible and just juggle it and you know you will find success in in that. So she's right here. My inspiration is <laughs> right I'm here. Still close to her. <laughs> Can I just say a... you got to do better by now. You're a judge. <laughs> Come on. What? No, I'm connected to you. You're connected to Tanya. I, look. <laughs> it's a it's family, right? It's a, it it's a family tree. It is. It is. It becomes that because right. we are a small bunch. So it becomes that. Judge Mc, thank you so much for that. It was, it was a great. That was, that was great, Judge McLaughlin, Scott McLaughlin. Um, so, uh, first off, all these wonderful females on this panel who I've known over the years, I, I was like Judge Johnson, I was Judge Edwards, um, law clerk, when I just finished taking the bar exam, I worked with her and her two colleagues before becoming a court attorney, um, Judge Kennedy, I've admired my entire time in the court system and have watched her profile, have watched her move and blossom and seen the trail she's taken, so I've been taking notes. Um, about all three of these, no, no, but for me, um, my first introduction actually was as a newborn in the back of a courtroom. My dad was doing a trial after I was born, and my mom brought me uh, to the back room of the courthouse every day in Washington, D.C., while he was doing a, um, a trial. 
So that was my first introduction into the Lee Courthouse, the judiciary, into the law. Um, and it's been part of my life since, since I was small. My parents did civil rights work, labor and employment, Ku Klux Klan cases, cross burning cases, police brutality cases, voting rights cases. So that was um, normal to me, but I was not sure to be a lawyer at the beginning. I was like, how do you have so much to say? You'd be locked, <laughs> my dad, be, and I thought I'd be locked in a room for days, we come out only for meals. And I was like, how do you have so much to write? I could not as a kid understand like, so many pages, so many words, so many hours. But I took a law class um, in college and, and it made sense to me. It was English. I worked at a law firm after law, after college and realized I had found my tribe. I had found others who, who were similar to myself. And so really my parents put that seed in me, gave me space to explore other things. And then I circled back to love the law. And just as a side, one of your parents um, had a connection to Constance Baker Motley, is that right? Yes, uh, my dad did a case back in, I think the nineties, early 2000s, it was called Campbell versus Guglielmo. It was um, an off-duty cop had shot um, Charles Campbell in the parking lot of a deli um, in Westchester. And I believe one of the last kind of trials that Justice Motley did, my father was first chair for the case, my stepmother was sitting second chair and the case went to verdict and they were able to obtain post-trial a judgment in a large monetary amount on behalf of plaintiff Campbell. All right, so I'll just, just pause there for a bit of a plug for Roosevelt House uh, because we have an event that uh, for or about Constance Baker Motley on the 28th of February. Um, and for everyone's edification, the first black woman. Um, she was the first black woman to be confirmed to a federal judgeship in 1966. Judge Constance Baker Motley uh, earned her law degree from Columbia Law School in 1946, spent the next 20 years as an attorney with the NAACP Legal Defense Fund and Educational Fund. Uh, she was hired by Justice Marshall. Her work featured a string of landmark de desegregation cases, including Brown versus Board of Ed, the year before her nomination to the Federal District Court in Manhattan by former President Lyndon Johnson, she became the first Black woman elected to serve in the New York State Senate. So a lot to talk about with respect to Justice Constant Baker Motley, and you can um, come to our event here at, at Roosevelt House on the 28th and, and learn so much more about her inspiring life. Uh, Judge Edwards, who inspired you? Um, you know, to be honest with you, it was probably a, a bunch of folks. Um, I didn't really know lawyers and judges coming up. Um, turns out once I, you know, really got into going to law school at Howard, um, I did know one. I just, you know, I didn't know it at the time, and that would be Jeff Greenup. Um, he's a brother from Harlem. Um, he's passed on now, and uh, he all of a sudden became my godfather. <laughs> you know, that's all I could say. He took me through, watched out for me. He was just so dignified, so eloquent you know, the way he handled himself, um, just a, a Southern gentleman to his core. Great, great attorney. Um, O.T. Wells um, was also one of my mentors. He was our of counsel. And we sat and listened to him for hours and hours and hours. Just so blessed. He's also passed on. Um, it, you know, coming up through Howard, you know, we learned about the civil rights attorneys. So Charles Hamilton Houston, obviously Thurgood Marshall, Constance Bacon Martley, you know, everybody I read about, you know, um, we talk about being social engineers and that was something that was drilled into us and that I knew that's part of me and that's the way I was hoping that I could live my life and become that way as an attorney and now as a judge. Um, I just wanted to say that one last, one last thing on this point, I don't wanna take up too much time, but you know, I did not have any black judge role models. I didn't know anybody, you know, and, I, and I've, I've told this story before, but like in, in what we used to call baby judge school, after you get elected or appointed, you go to class. And when I was assigned to criminal, we sat around the table, you know, maybe about 10 new judges, all, all of us as goofy as can be, smiling at each other. And we practiced doing an, a criminal arraignment. And we went around the table. I had my notes. I was all ready to go. And when I spoke, I said, bail is set in the amount of, and, and everybody looked at me. I changed my voice to what I thought a judge would sound like subconsciously. 
and I became a middle-aged balding white man with glasses <laughs> just like that and it was so stupid <laughs> and it's it, like I had to correct myself <clears throat> you know and then I I said oh my goodness I'm a judge I could be me you know and then I was me from that point forward <laughs> oh, that's that's fantastic judge judge Kennedy um um who was who was your inspiration well, I mentioned Betty Lawrence Lewis, but I'm also grateful to her because she really was very supportive when I was at Corporation Council and certainly encouraged me to, to seek a supervisory role. And, and I, I did become a, a supervisor and I still uh, remain very closer to this day. But certainly the judge that I worked for, uh, the Honorable Barry A. Cozier, who is now uh, retired, but I joined him in uh, 1999, uh, initially in the commercial division. And then when he was appointed to the appellate division, second department, and I, you know, and I want to say this one thing about Judge Cozy. I mean, I, I can talk about him throughout the whole program, but the, the bottom line is that he knew that I was very comfortable in a courtroom because of my background in family court, being a litigator, um, being a supervisor, but my writing was okay. However, he gave me a chance. He saw my potential. Now, initially, you know, when we're doing the edits, a lot of red marks, you know, that's how he would edit. I was like, oh, but you know, as time went by, less red, look where I am now. And we still remain in contact. Each uh, step in my career, he's always been there uh, guiding me. I didn't tell him about the program tonight, but we even spoke yesterday. So um, I'm forever grateful uh, to uh, the Honorable Barry A. Cozier, as well as Betty Lawrence Lewis. That's fantastic. And before I go any farther or further, further farther, um, Judge Scott McLaughlin, I'm being told and asked since she's talked so much about your father to say his name. Oh, yes, sure. Sorry, Randolph McLaughlin. All right. He also was a professor at Pace um, Law School as well. All right, there we go. Um, you know, all of you mentioned a couple of things tonight, which are, I, I hear, are, are sort of recurring themes in, in your work, writing, right? um, clerkships sounds like. And so I wonder for those of us that are, I know you can't really talk about that. You can't talk about the nomination process, but you know, there are a lot of other folks out here who are talking about it and thinking about it. Um, but what role, so this is for sort of our general conversation, but also directed to some of the students out there. There are a lot of CUNY students who are listening to this program right now, some in law school, some in pre-law programs. For those budding lawyers out there, how important is writing? How important are clerkships? How important or how much does ideology factor into the work that you do and perhaps in the in your ascension within the within the profession? Anybody can take that, that wants to. Respond. I don't mind starting. Yes, um, so to me, writing is crucial. It's it's about getting your point of cross. Legal writing is different, you know, and being a judge, it's different. And I was told less is more. I mean, you could spend days writing one decision on something that really could have been decided in, in a page and a half. Um, people that I found, you know, actually being, you know, a practicing attorney, you want the answer, <laughs> you want it to be clear, and then you decide what you want to do. If you want to appeal it, you can, you can uh, discuss things with your client, you can advise them properly, but being persuasive, it's like creating a masterpiece to me, <laughs> you know, some decisions, um, they, it, it's, it's a different art form, you know, again, being persuasive, it's based on the law, and being firm, you know, not being wishy-washy, um, you know, it's a court, we're a judge, you know, we're creating law. Um, so definitely, and also it's not just the writing, but what goes into it beforehand with a court attorney or with the legal argument, understanding the issues, fine tuning it, having control of the courtroom, control of an argument. 
um, you know, fine tuning the legal issues and asking the right questions so that you, you, you know, that you know, so that you know how to proceed and you can be very clear and decisive in your decision making. Anybody else want to? I would add, I would add, um, I of course agree with all of those things, um, but understanding the law first, it's important, no matter where you are, if you're uh, writing a decision from the bench, if you are the advocate, the defendant, prosecutor, plaintiff, petitioner, defendant, no matter where you are, you've got to start with clearly understanding what the law is. And I think then as judges, um, in terms of criminal law, I philosophically believe that the best decisions are those based on law, but also uh, where compassion is exercised, where there's discretion to do so. And I, I think that that's probably a philosophy that can be applicable um, in civil areas as well, particularly in family court. Um, compassion must be a part of uh, how a judge analyzes what it is that they're trying to make a decision on. And to the nominee that Biden selects, because this person has had, because she, because this black woman will have had such a, a, a lengthy career, because she will have been um, put into various um, courts and have had to make complex decisions, I don't doubt that she will be versed in the law. I don't doubt that her writing will be superb. Um, I believe that there are many Black women who fit those basic requirements. The politics will come into play and be a decisional factor in who is ultimately chosen. But when we talk about just her basic skills um, and qualifications to be a Supreme Court nominee, I think anyone who's put forward will have those, the writing, a command of the law, and respect of the bar. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anybody else want to take a step at it? Judge I, 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 I will. I agree with uh, my two colleagues. I, I like to add uh, analytical ability, certainly oral uh, communication skills, but I want to kind of go off the beaten path, if I may. Technology. And the reason why mm -hmm. I say that is because in light of COVID-19, we see uh, the ever increasing reliance on technology. That has been a game changer in the legal profession. And so for these students, for uh, the lawyers, I think it's gonna be key to really have your finger on the pulse of technology and, and certainly how technology can even further advance um, equal access to justice for all. So I think now, you know, uh, lawyers and lawyers to be have to really be more creative and, and innovative when we're talking about this. And, and lastly, you have to know how the courts work. So you have to visit uh, the courts, you know, get some experience and I'll stop there. And I'm talking about volunteer experience. You could be mm -hmm. perpetrator, you know, small claims court. Now stop. Right. Dina, I want to come. Oh, Judge Scott McLaughlin, you wanted to say something. And then I have a question. Oh, I concur with all three of my colleagues. Um, writing is crucial, understanding the law is crucial. And also, um, who are we dealing with? What is the subject matter? When you're a lawyer for a criminal matter and family court matter, housing court matter, there's a different way you can handle the problem. So I think definitely going to observe, seeing what it's about, how does it work, how it function, state court, federal court, pop in the courthouse post code probably to see how do these things happen. Go visit night court. What do arraignments look like? Who is sitting yeah. where? That is a whole nother kettle of fish. Mm -hmm. And you can just slide in the pew, hang out, take your notes, see how is it going, and then you know circle back. You, you can go to these panels, any event, any lawyer that's interesting or fascinating, Google them, go hear them talk. So fun fact, my dad's civil rights lawyer. His mentor was William Kunstler, favorite person in the whole world, shadowed him, found him. Here's the story. My father went to a talk William Kunstler was giving. 
ran to the front of the crowd after he was finished talking and asked for his business card. He didn't know any lawyers. Got the business card, finished law school, and made the phone call, and then became his mentee. Mm -hmm. So go see them, get their card, and call them. And, and I, you know, I want to piggyback a little bit on that because I was a like, Judge Johnson. You wanted to say something. It just if I may, you know, when yeah, I when 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 I was I think um, finished law school my third summer I was studying for the bar and I would go sit in night court just to observe the criminal arraignment, you know, consistent with what Judge Stockton Crawford said. I would just sit and I I went to sit so much that the supervisor of night arraignments inquired, who is this woman? Who is this young woman sitting here? And then invited me to go do interviews with him. He invited me across the bench, across the bar in order to, to come and participate. And it was a wonderful opportunity. So yeah, just go, spend your time that way. Now we're almost, we're coming, um to uh, eight or so minutes before the end of our discussion. So I'm going to ask to keep the uh, answer short, not quite lightning round, but somewhere in the middle. Um, Judge Scott McLaughlin, what I wanted to ask you was based on our, we had a conversation about, you know, some of the things that you see in housing court. Judge Johnson talked about compassion on the bench. Uh, Makeda, who's asked a question, and thank you, Makeda, for, for confirming that it is further and not farther. Um, but Makeda's question, as a judge, does being Black, and more specifically a Black woman, affect the way you feel you will be seen for having certain opinions on certain issues? I feel like the way I'm perceived in society will be a focal point in the public policy, uh, in, in the public policy career I will ultimately end up taking. And I wanted to know how one or all of you navigate that and your emotions. So I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to that, but also this and this issue of compassion, because, you know, as we were talking um, yesterday about uh, what you see in housing court, um, and 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 the multitude of problems that affect this issue of housing, and how you have to be mindful of that. So I try and be mindful that housing is just one problem someone's having. It's usually a life problem has occurred. And, and all kinds of things are not quite where they should be, and they end up in housing court, whether it be financial, whether it be family, whether it be someone got sick during COVID, whether someone passed away in a foreign country, they had to go do a funeral, all kinds of social problems are happening in their life, and they end up in housing court. But also, someone has a business. They've bought property to make income, to have a business. So part of the balancing act is this is someone's business. The rent roll is only so high for the whole building and there's a person having a problem. And is there a way that I can split the baby so that everyone is not necessarily happy, maybe a little grumpy, but at least everyone's gotten something. And if I can do that, I often will go that route. No. And, and is there, and for, for you and for the other, uh, for the other judges, are you, do you, are you concerned at all about how you're perceived as a Black woman based on your decisions from the bench? Does that come into your mind at all? As the lightning round, my answer is no, not at all. <laughs> okay, okay. Fair I'm enough. Saying, yeah. Yeah, you'd say no, right. And I mean, there... it's not, you know, we didn't become a Black woman when we got to the bench, <laughs> right? We've been Black women faced with people's perceptions and biases our entire career, our, you know, and one of the things that I remember are the people who I respect and who I want to make sure respect me, starting with myself, but then others, right? Justice Edwards, Justice Kennedy, Judge Scott McLaughlin. I want to make sure that my core group continues to respect me and that I feel good about what I do. So I, I, I can't be concerned about what someone else is going to, to say about a decision I make. I make the decision, that's my job as judge, and I own it. All right. Now, I'm going to take a, few, a, a minute for moderator's privilege here to say something before we end. And it's based on the points that all of you made. When I was younger, I wanted to be a lawyer. 
And I was a freshman, just finished my freshman year at Cornell. Summer between freshman and sophomore year, I was a legal intern at the Bronx DA's office under Robert Jeff. Um, not sure how I got that job uh, because I was the only undergraduate in that role. And interestingly enough, I met some really good friends who went on to do other things. The head of that, the bureau that I worked in at the DA's office is, was Gail Edwards, who's now a judge, and Guy Mitchell, was a legal intern who's now a judge. Um, and so I met some really wonderful folks during that time. But not knowing anything about the law, I actually did a lot of what you all said. The time that I had, I went to arraignment court and I just sat down and watched what was happening. Um, I got to go to some crime scenes with the, with the ADAs. I was writing um, um, briefs, even though I had no idea what I was doing. But I just asked. I actually just asked, and there were people who were kind enough, I'll call their names, Deborah Okanek was one, and Gail Edwards I mentioned earlier, who just let me go into their office and this little 18 year old was asking probably the stupidest questions and they're like, what is he doing here? But it gave me this incredible opportunity to really understand what lawyers, particularly district attorneys did on a day-to-day -day basis. I wound up not going to law school. Um, but that's okay, because I realized that this was not my path. So for those for whom it might be, I would give all of you the last word to say, um, they have that, they're not growing up like I did watching Blair Underwood in LA Law saying, I want to be that guy. Um, for those of a certain vintage on the call, you'll understand that reference. But for, for young students today, give them one good piece of advice. And also for other judges not on the panel, give them a piece of advice in terms of what they can do to train the next generation or raise the next generation. And for those that are young, one piece of advice to move forward in perhaps following your footsteps. I know that was a two part question. Okay, I would say for the young people, try all things try all things. So you can sort it out before grown up years come about to see what place might fit you best. I think it's important to make sure that we always reach back to try to help others, um, whether, I mean, I've had interns for a day, you know, people can't commit and, you know, it's not, we, we don't pay, <laughs> you know, so it's a volunteer job, but an intern for a day, I've had people just come on calls, you know, if we're, especially virtually, it allows us to have a lot of opportunities. Um, I do my best in the courtroom to try to encourage um, attorneys at firms to bring in a second person to second seat, give them a speaking role, not just sit there and hand you papers. Um, and I, I feel like that's, that's how people gain experience, especially COVID set a lot of people back, but it does not mean you can't create your own opportunities. And maybe, you know, judges like, like me, maybe we can't commit to so many people for a full summer, but asking to come in, you know, every Monday for three weeks, you know, that's something we can all do. You know, we can, we can do something like that, like that, trying to be creative to give people opportunities to learn. I would say to the young people, be persistent. Um, that internship I mentioned in Justice Edwards' office was because I kept going. They were very busy. But it I, was I annoying. It, don't annoy. <laughs> don't annoy, but be persistent. Know the difference. I went three times to get that internship. <laughs> so, you know, be persistent in the pursuit of your goals and your dreams. Uh, to colleagues, I would say uh, don't rely on the top 10% of the class to fill your needs in chamber. You know, take the Take some from the top, take some from the middle, and take one from the bottom. And they will help each other along the way. Um, and you'll end up getting your needs satisfied that you need in chamber. But you know, don't, Fantastic. don't ignore the student at the bottom. Fantastic point. Judge Kennedy. Uh, for the young people, I would say um, opportunities happen when you show up. Uh, so you have to be assertive. And uh, for all of us, um, we didn't get here on our own. We had other people to help us. So it's very important that all of us that we have to reach back. And as we um, move up, 
we have to bring people with us. Wow. It's been an incredible hour. Um, Judge Malika Scott McLaughlin, Judge Janine Johnson, Judge Tanya R. Kennedy, Judge Erica Edwards. I just want you to know that we see you and we're proud of you. And thank you so much for, for joining us today. For all of those who, um, who are in attendance, remember we do have an event, um, a, a great event uh, centering around Constance Baker Motley on February 28th, her life and career. Um, it's going to be an incredible. Uh, it's going to be an incredible book talk um, by uh, with us here at Roosevelt House. So we encourage you to learn more about that event and so many others that we have coming up by going to RooseveltHouse.Hunter.CUNY.EDU uh, for our panel and for our guests. Thank you so much. I hope this was enlightening, and we go forward uh, with intentionality. Uh, around all of these issues. So thank you all very much and have a great evening. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.